Last week, we touched on the 10 mysterious photos explained, where we looked at some of the debunked and explained images that are spread as mystery. Well now we're swapping sides and looking at the unexplained photos still circulating to date. Hesdon Light These unusual lights have been reported here since the 1940s or earlier. Especially high activity of Hesdon Lights took place from December 1981 until summer of 1984, when lights were observed 15 to 20 times per week. The frequency of the lights caused a gathering of numerous tourists staying there overnight to see the phenomenon. Since then, the activity has decreased, and now the lights are observed some 10 or 20 times per year. The Hesdon lights most often is a bright, white or yellow light from unknown origin standing or floating above the ground level. Sometimes the lights can be seen for more than an hour. There are several other types of unexplained lights observing in Hesdilan Valley. This photo comes with a story already written. It details an account of a strange sighting. This is the story. As I have said in previous posts, I work at sea. Last month we came to a dry dock to carry out refit and repairs. Dry dock is when a ship is brought into a lock, the gates closed and all the water pumped out, leaving the ship high and dry on the blocks, thus allowing repairs and inspections etc of the underside of the hull. Next to us was an old military brigade being broken down for scrap. She had arrived about two weeks prior to us. Once the frigate was on the blocks and dry, all of the crew left the old girl to her fate. A sad sight, but that's how these things go. Once all the sensitive stuff had been removed, the dock workers were free to go on. The dock foreman, John, went on board first with a camera to take pictures of work areas. He took a couple hundred all in all. This was one of them. He later sent all of the pics to his boss, who upon seeing this one, called John straight away asking, who was the guy with the axe at the edge of the camera flash? John had no idea. He never saw anyone. The area where this picture was taken was in a cross alleyway, deep inside the ship. He was going around with a torch and a camera, when he'd go to take a picture, he would turn off the torch, leaving himself in total darkness, snap the shot, turn the torch back on and be on his way. Due to the fact that it was a military vessel, the police were called. A search was carried out, but no one was found. There was one way on and off the ship, and that was by a gangway covered by CCTV. You couldn't jump over the side, as it was 25 meter drop to concrete. No one was seen to leave the ship after John had taken this. I am a skeptic. Maybe it's a trick of the flash reflecting off something. But if you really zoom in, you can just make out the guy's face, ear, collar of his jacket, and the axe in a meaty fist. Now, it could be John blowing smoke up my ass, but when he was telling the story, he seemed genuinely rattled. And the guy in the pic looks nothing like any of the workers we met at the dock. This gave me serious goosebumps. Needless to say, I did not go on board for a look. This image plus story is especially interesting as the person then followed it up with more pictures proving that they were doing a job there. And more disturbing is an enhanced image of the figure, ominously staring at the person taking the picture. Most ghost images look pretty fake to the modern eye, but this shot by Montagu Cooper is pretty disquieting. Taken in the early 20th century, at the request of a furniture dealer who bought the impressive bureau for a song, when the film was developed, the spectral image of a hand became visible, 
reaching out from one of the drawers. Most photo analysts have worked over the image and have been unable to find any signs of tampering or double exposures, which is pretty unsettling. Nearly all human civilizations have legends of giants, men standing many feet taller than the average with incredible strength, but no fossil evidence has ever been found of one, unless you count the disturbing photographs taken by a man named Gregor Spori in 1985. On a trip to Egypt, Spori met an old grave robber who was in possession of a mummified finger measuring 15 inches long. One that would have had to come from a man at least 12 feet tall. Nobody's ever been able to explain or debunk the pictures he took. This one is the most recent picture on this list. Ceres is the largest object in the asteroid belt, which lies between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Several bright surface features were discovered on the dwarf planet by the Dawn spacecraft in 2015. The brightest cluster of spots, spot 5, is located in an 80 km or 50 mile wide crater called Akator. The largest and brightest component of the cluster is in the center of this crater, with dimmer spots located towards this crater's eastern rim. There have been a few attempts to try solve this one, some saying it's salt reflecting light, ice, or a volcanic eruption, but nothing seems conclusive so far. On March 13th, 1997, a series of bright, unidentified lights appeared over the city of Phoenix, Arizona, and remained there, completely stationary for hours. The varying witness testimonies have made it difficult to break down the sightings of the incident but it is generally agreed that there were two distinct events occurring within a few hours of each other. The first came in the form of a V-shaped light formation that was initially witnessed on the Nevada slash Arizona border at around 1855 PST, before moving south to Tuscan at a rapid pace. The second, and more widely reported set of sightings, were more localized to the Phoenix area, and consisted of a formation estimated to be larger than a football field. This second event would hang in the sky for around 30 minutes and was captured on film by countless witnesses. The timeline goes as follows. 1955 MST A group of lights in a V-shaped formation were witnessed in Henderson, Nevada. Witnesses state the lights were roughly the size of a large, passenger jet. 2015. Multiple reports of similar formation come from Prescott, Arizona, some 200 miles southeast of Henderson. Shortly after, more reports of lights in the sky came in from nearby Dewey, Arizona, 10 miles east of Prescott. 2020. Reports of the V-shaped formation spread to around Phoenix, including Temp and Glendale. 2030, a man and his wife witness a light formation above their home in Chandler, 20 miles south east of Phoenix. 2045, a report of lights in the sky is received from a man in Tuscan, 100 miles southeast of Phoenix. According to the report, the lights were visible for around 10 minutes before disappearing behind the Santa Catalina Mountains. 2200. A new, even larger wave of reports come flooding in from Phoenix. Witnesses describe a number of lights hanging in the air above the city for a substantial amount of time. While barely any video or photographic evidence emerged from the previous light formation, the second Phoenix event was captured on film by multiple Phoenicians, and, as such, was covered far more widely in the media. The Air Force said that the lights were flares, dropped for a training exercise. However, the lights reappeared over Phoenix in 2007 and 2008. They still have not been explained.
Murder scene photos typically help investigators put together the pieces surrounding a death. But what St. Petersburg, Florida cops snapped in 1951 has baffled us for over half a century. The death scene of Mary Reeser was a grim and bizarre one. The woman's entire body had been engulfed by flames in her armchair, consuming every bit of her but her left foot, which was intact. The intense heat had actually shrunken her skull, but bizarrely, nothing else in the room was touched. The pictures baffle forensic investigators to this day. The woman in the brown coat, or the babushka lady, as she was later called by the FBI, was clearly close to JFK when he was assassinated in Dallas. According to eyewitnesses, this woman filmed the entire thing. It's thought that from a vantage point, she may have been able to answer some critical questions about what really happened that day. However, the FBI was never able to track her down, and no one has since been able to figure out the identity of the mysterious observer. Directly following the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, FBI and CIA investigators began questioning and taking statements from spectators, whom were present on the afternoon of November 22, 1963. Those who were filming or photographing the day, especially when the shots were fired, had pictures and film taken by the investigators. These statements, pictures and films would then be pieced together to determine exactly what happened. The photos and films were not necessarily the best of quality, but nevertheless, they provided evidence that has since been examined over and over. In panic following the shooting, bystanders fled for cover. It was not immediately clear which direction the shots came from, and people ran in every direction, running into each other and fleeing towards whatever safe places they could find. The evidence the investigators collected was conflicting. Hundreds of witnesses record different events, statements changed, the pictures and films became more important. Clearly shown in several photographs is a woman with what appears to be a camera of some kind in front of her face, pointing directly at the president's motorcade when the shots were fired. A call went out from the FBI to everyone who had been in the vicinity of the assassination and had been taking photos or filming. The babushka lady never came forward despite evidence showing that she was capturing the tragedy in some way from a relatively good position. Interestingly, a Dallas film developer later told FBI agents that he had developed a single color slide brought in by an unknown woman. The slide was somewhat blurry, but from the developer's description, it matched up as being from the spot the babushka lady was standing, or at least very close to it. Supposedly, there is an ancient, dark object that has been orbiting Earth for at least 13,000 years called the Black Knight Satellite. No one knows how it got there, its purpose, or even who started to call it the Black Knight. The photo shown was taken during an American space shuttle mission to the International Space Station in 1998. There are several theories and speculations on where this thing has came from, but nothing inclusive as of yet. The Falcon Lake incident is a reported unidentified flying object encounter in May 20th, 1967. Stefan McCulloch in White Shell Province Park was trying to prospect veins of quartz near Falcon Lake, Manitoba, Canada, when he spotted two cigar-shaped objects descending one of which landed near him. One of the objects stopped in the air, while the other landed on a big rock 160 feet away from McCulloch. After some moments, the object floating above McCulloch flew directly west, disappearing through the clouds. The landed object changed to grey, and then to a colour similar to incandescent stainless steel. From the interior opening of the subject, some violet rays were emitted, 
As Mechanic was using special glasses to examine the quartz, the rays didn't affect him. Half an hour passed, and Mechanic still was observing the spaceship. Suddenly, a door opened and he could see that the interior of the UFO was very illuminated. He approached some meters and heard some voices coming from inside the ship. Believing that the object was an experimental flying object, he tried to make contact in English. As no answers were given, he tried other languages in vain. Nervous, he walked up to the open door and saw a panel and some lights inside the ship. He did not see anybody, so he waited. Suddenly, the door closed. Despite the surprise, he discovered a colourful glass around the UFO. He attempted to touch it, but his glove simply melted, the heat hurting his hand through the glove's protection. Quietly, a metallic box of holes got off the UFO, what seemed to be a grid-like exhaust vent. A steamy explosion occurred, and some kind of gas was expelled in his direction. Immediately, his clothes started to burn. As the object flew away, Michalik was left behind desperately trying to extinguish the flames. Once the fire was extinguished, Michalik felt pain and sickness, and noticed a metallic odour from the inside of his body, like the smell of something electrical that is burning. He tried to go to the motel, but he stopped several times, feeling sick. He was later treated upon arrival at the hospital. He initially claimed the burns were caused by airplane exhaust. McCallick's family physician, R.D. Ottaway, reported that McCallick was confused and dazed, but rational. Ottaway further reported hair loss and a series of several oval-shaped sores on McCallick's chest and abdomen in a grate-like pattern, similar to a first-degree burn. The nature of these burns remain difficult to explain, and is the subject of the photo you're looking at now. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this week's list, and if you did, leave a like. And if you want to see another similar list, click here to watch my 10 mysterious photos explained. <laughs>